Coming up, we got H-Town Wheelhouse, one half of the Locked on Astros podcast on the pod to discuss the D-backs versus Astros series, the MVP, and should anyone be fearful, or should the Astros, I should say, be fearful of anyone in the postseason? We'll discuss that all with H-Town next. You are Locked on Diamondbacks. Your daily Arizona Diamondbacks podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome into the Locked On Dimebacks podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day listening to who? Always charismatic host of this podcast, Miller Thomas. I'm a multimedia journalist and I'm a graphic designer, so please go check out my website, millerthomas24.myportfolio.com. On there, you can see all my latest work from my packages to my articles to my photos and my graphic design. Go check us out on YouTube, Locked on Dimebacks on there as well. And also, thank you for making Locked on Dimebacks your first listen every day. I would not be able to do this podcast without you, my loyal listeners, sharing, subscribing, reviewing, doing all that so I could do this podcast for you. Thank you. It's free and available on all platforms, so please continue to tell your friends. And today's episode is brought to you by Bet Online. Bet Online has you covered this season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. Bet Online where the game starts now there we got all the details and the minutia out the way it's time to talk a little baseball it's playoff time it's award season so the d-backs are not in the postseason so we had to bring on somebody who knows a thing or two about the playoffs because his team has been in the championship series or better every year since 2017 really crazy to think about so we got one half of the Locked On Astros podcast on the pod today. We got H Town Wheelhouse, Brett. How you doing today, sir? Man, I'm doing great. You know, it's it's great to talk to you. I always in, enjoy having you on the show. Sorry, I wasn't able to be on there with you and Eric the other day, but you always bring the heat. You always got the great takes out there in Arizona. I mean, you got hot takes like that hot Arizona sun. So I appreciate that. Yeah, you know, the Astros are on this historic run. They're still on it, and if, if you would have told me two years ago that Carlos Correa wouldn't be in the playoffs in 2022, I would say, ah, there's no way he's going to be an Astro for life. Well, we know things took a turn there, but really I think one of the stories and we can get into it a little bit is Jose Altuve. Jose Altuve is quietly having almost a better season offensively than he had in 2017 when he won the MVP. And, and it's astounding what other players up in New York, First name Aaron, last name Judge is doing this year as well. So there's a ton of baseball to talk about. Even if your team's not in the playoffs, there's a ton of storylines that are exciting. Mm -hmm. For baseball fans, I think 2022 is going to be one of the best postseasons of all time. Yeah, and I kind of made that argument on my pod yesterday about how baseball really needed these storylines with the Albert Pujols home run chase and the Aaron Judge home run chase because really, outside like the Houston Astros scandal, like what narratives have brought the casual fan back to baseball? What narratives have made the casual fan turn on a baseball game and say, hey, let me get to my TV because I got to watch that at bat. Otani's a spectacle, but it's like, unless uh, unless it's the days he's pitches, you're probably not going to tune into Otani versus Royals game because there's not really a level of intrigue there between two terrible teams outside of maybe Otani. Tani's pitching that day so felt like baseball really needed this because I think outside the Astro scandal maybe the biggest narrative that brought you know the casual fan back to the sport maybe it was Derek Jeter's 3000th hit like I was just thinking over the last 10 years like how many storylines brought the casual fan back to baseball and I felt like that MLB really needed these home run chases by Aaron Judge and Albert Pujols. Well, it's funny that you say that because um, the home run chase between Sosa and McGuire, McGuire is my all-time favorite player. You can't see his jersey because I've got Altuve and Bagwell covering up in the background. I got that signed back in 1998 in the Astrodome when he was chasing that record. And a lot of people forget that season. King Griffey Jr. was also chasing the record. And he's kind of a forgotten – it's it's kind of hard to believe that. King Griffey Jr. is a forgotten name in, a, in one of the most famous home run chases because there for a while he was keeping pace with these guys. We know that King Griffey Jr., for all intents and purposes, was clean. And so maybe that's why he couldn't hold up the steam the way the other guys did. And that's the thing. I mean, Aaron Judge, you know, we root for two teams in my house, the Astros and whoever's playing the Yankees. But Aaron Judge – 
he's the player that if he's not on your team, you love to root against him. But you don't root against him because he's a bad dude. You root against him because you know he can do damage. The only two wins the Yankees got on the Astros this year were walk-offs by Aaron Judge. And so um, he can hurt you with his bat. And he has made some kind of adjustment this year. He has really improved at the plate. And he bet on himself. He went out and he didn't take this offer from the Yankees. And I would say it's working out quite well for him. He's going to get paid. Yeah, and the interesting is, yeah, who knows where he's going to get paid. I think he did have a t-shirt on the other day where it said, New York or nowhere. But let's not forget, the Yankees are not the only team in New York. There's another New York owner with a whole lot of money. So maybe Judge was sending a little subliminal message. Yankees, if you don't want to pay me, hey, I'm still going to be in New York. I just might be playing for the other team. That would be very exciting to see. That would be. And, you know, for him to get 61, and I know you had mentioned in the intro about what, or you know, what people are saying about 61. Mm-hmm. What people, you know, some people are like, oh, it's nice to tie for seventh all time. And then some people are like, wait, but the only true 60 plus home run hitters are Roger Maris and now Aaron Judge. Yeah. And it really, you know, it's a really tough conversation because, Millard, I really think the whole steroid era is a lot more of an onion than it is a black and white issue. I Mm -hmm. think Major League Baseball created its own scenario. I think players were following suit. I think pitchers and hitters were both using equally. And these were aging athletes, and most of them didn't need it. Most of them were were elite athletes. You had very few guys all of a sudden hitting 20, 30 home runs. It was the guys that had been hitting 30, 40 home runs started hitting 50 and 60 home runs. Mm-hmm. And when they started naming all the times that like Sosa and McGuire both hit 60 plus home runs, I mean, Sosa did it like three years of, or, you know, for three seasons, you know, McGuire did it for two or three. And, but Aaron Judge, here's my question Is Aaron Judge going to follow this up with another 60 home run season? Because if Aaron Judge does that, that puts him in rarefied air because he hasn't yet been linked to any steroids. I know a lot of people say, oh, he's probably using steroids. He's got a juice, blah, 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 blah. But he hasn't. And until someone's proven to have taken steroids and then until that's a part of the conversation, you got to say he's the first clean guy to hit 60 plus since Roger Maris. And Roger Maris Jr. kind of had a point in his press conference. Yeah, and let's not act like it's a total surprise. I'm not saying you, but like the general public for the people who are saying he's taking steroids, like, yeah, it could happen, but let's not act like it's a total surprise he hit 60, considering as a rookie, he hit 52 home runs as a rookie. So it's like, so if like Pete Alonso all of a sudden hits 60 next year, like he's another guy that had 50 plus as a rookie, had 40 plus home runs this year. If all of a sudden he jumps to 60 plus home runs next year, then I, I don't think it would be something crazy. If someone that was like you said, a 25 to 30 home run guy and all of a sudden they're on pace to maybe have a home run record like that's when you're like getting a little crazy and it's like all right let's let's get this guy drug tested right it's kind of like um a a great arizona diamondback hitter luis gonzalez Uh, (laughs) i'll have to i would have to track his home run totals throughout the years real quick to see uh because he hit he hit him and steve finley man they both started jacking some baseball's out of there and we know Ken Caminetti's history and what, what he did in his career um you know it's funny someone the other day said how do, how do you know Jeff Bagwell didn't use steroids I'm like he never got caught he never tested positive so until I see a positive test I'm not gonna throw that on any player you know I I think it's just a way to bring somebody down but but this this season though with Otani with Judge you know Jordan Alvarez was really sneaking was. into the MVP conversation. And then he kind of fell off. He went through a little bit of a slump. And I think that's what took off the Otani versus Judge. Yeah, because if you look at Jordan's, I think, like, WRC plus right around the All-Star break, I think he might have been ahead of Aaron Judge in that stat. So, like, was. some some numbers suggested he might have been the best offensive player at the time, despite Aaron Judge, you know, having some more traditional numbers or, over Jordan at the time. Jordan still had maybe the advanced numbers over Judge. So, uh, it's very interesting because how what is Jordan's, like, health right now? Because isn't he, like, in and out the lineup right now? He has he has been, you know, him, you know he, he tweaked his left ankle the other day in the game and – um, he's had some issues, like he slid into a base. Like, I think they held him out for one game after that. Um, I mean, here's the thing. He's a big menacing fella. And as big as Aaron judges, it's something about Jordan's size that 
you, I mean, you have to watch them. And I've never been to handle them like kids gloves and don't, I'm like, let them play as much as possible. Cause I feel like if you're not playing them all you can, then you're trying to be too careful. Then you get into the psyche of the player. And the, the second the player starts thinking, I want to go out there and not get hurt is usually when athletes get hurt. Mm-hmm. And Jordan's probably the closest guy to judge in terms of measurements. Just raw because judge is listed at 6'7", 282, which is just insane. But Jordan's at 6'5", 225. So he's a thick boy, too. You can't play around with Jordan. No. No, I mean, and, you know, I, I just want to take this time to thank the Dodgers for Jordan okay. Alvarez. And Josh Fields, I we we continue. He's the gift that keeps on giving. Let me see. What what was the deal? Did you guys trade for Jordan from? We the traded. We traded Josh Fields for him. Wow. They needed a relief pitcher, and and Josh Fields, respectively, didn't do terrible. Now in the World Series, we we hit him around, but Jordan Alvarez wasn't even really on the radar when Luna finally called on him. He said, we want, we want Alvarez. And there was a guy in double A or single A. And they said, you mean the pitcher is like, no, I want that. I want the, we want the Cuban kid. And they're like, he hasn't even played for us yet. They're like, yeah, you know what? We'd like him. Um, we'll give you Josh Fields for him. They're like, okay. Yeah, that's crazy. I'm <laughs> actually, history. I'm looking at it all right now, actually. Yeah. 2016, just a straight up swap. The dude literally like 2016 was his first year in the professional league. So throwing a dart throw on that when you give up a reliever, that's a fantastic move by a GM. Like that's one of those things, like when people talk about like the Astros rebuild and there's like, yo, why doesn't every team just tank? Like look at what the Astros did. It worked out. I'm like, most teams don't hit on multiple dudes in the first, because the Astros like in 2014, 2015 hit on multiple yeah. dudes in the first few rounds you got that Jordan Alvarez trade in 2016 where you get you know an MVP type player for a reliever that's like not even in the league anymore like the Astros made so many crazy moves where they hit on the right players in the draft they made the right trades like it was basically a perfect rebuild by the Astros to get to where they are now I think most teams can't do that because you look at like the Tigers the Rangers all these teams that have been rebuilding for years like it just does not work the Astros model does not work because I think they just it was the perfect job of rebuilding. I don't think – I think it was more of an outlier than a model of what you can use to base your own rebuilding off of. Yeah. Now, I would say this. Watch the Baltimore Orioles. Mm-hmm. They have Mike Elias who came from the Astros, and this guy is quietly building – He, they are going to be the beast of the East. Mark my words, here in a couple of years, the Baltimore Orioles are going to win some AL East titles over the Yankees, over the Blue Jays, over the Rays, over the Red Sox. Mm. They have a perfect formula. They've got so many young studs. They've got pitchers. They've got guys in the minors they haven't even touched yet. And Mike Elias was one of the architects behind the Houston Astros building what they built. And that is what the Astros do so well, is they is they put the right guys in the right position. Jim Crane is a genius in putting people in the right position. Former um, Astros legend Dickie Thon, his son Joe Thon is one of the minor league managers. You've got minor league managers who have all kinds of wherewithal and they know what's going on. Oz Campo, who um, who talked about Brent Strom when he was here. Brent Strom, who you guys have, yeah. would go to, would go down to the minor league camps and he helped develop Garcia, Javier, um, Valdez, and these guys in Urquidy. He helped develop them. And now he passed it on to we have Miller and Murphy. But I'm serious, the Orioles, man, they are going to be players. They played some amazing baseball this year, and it's great for Baltimore because they got some. I mean, when you got talent like Rushman and Mullins and those guys, you want to see those guys have success, especially guys like us. We love seeing the Yankees get beat. We love seeing the Red Sox get beat. (laughs) So, But that may be the only other place I know that it's really going to happen in the next few years. Baltimore's building um, a monster out there. I mean, you already, yeah, like you said, you already saw it this year going from worse to being an almost playoff team. They basically yeah. had to blow up their team at the deadline so they could stop winning games because they're like, whoa, we're, we're years ahead of where we want to be in our rebuilding process. Let's slow it down. Let's scale it back and get some of these good players, veterans off our team at the trade deadline. Brett, I do want to ask you about who, because we touched on it a little bit about judging the MVP. So I want to ask you who you think is the AL MVP. But if you want to bet on who you think the AL MVP is going to be, hold on, hold on. Let me pull up the overlay. That's not the good one. There's the good overlay. Because if you want to bet on who's going to win the AL MVP, you need to head to betonline.net because it's your number one source for football betting info this season. 
Find all the latest player developments, team matchups, news, podcasts, and in-depth articles and analysis on every game you can find. And as always, BetOnline remains your continued source for all your sports wagering information with live betting and up-to-the-minute scores for every sport out there. The fastest and easiest way to check in on all your favorite games and events, including MLB, MMA, boxing, and golf. Head to BetOnline.net or use your mobile device to learn more. Bet online where the game starts. All right, we're here with H Town of Locked On Astros, real name Brett Wheelhouse. And H Town, I want to ask you the MVP is highly debated. I feel like every time I say Judge is the MVP, I get five comments call me an idiot. How can you not pick Otani? But I'm like, look, ju- I tweeted this out today. Judge has the cripple crown. Uh, the cripple crown. He has the triple crown. He just broke, or he at least tied the record, the American League home run record. We don't have to talk about whether you think detained it or whatever record. The American League home run record. He tied that triple crown. He currently leads. Leads the league in WRC plus. All of a sudden, no one cares about WAR anymore. He leads the league in that too. It's like he leads the league in all the stats. Otani, I know he can pitch, and I love Otani. He should finish second, but how can it not go to Judge in this historic season he's having? I agree with you 100%. I just, I understand what Otani is. And I I think um, Eric said it best. There needs to be a Babe Ruth Award. (laughs) And the Babe Ruth Award would go to Otani until somebody else came in as a two-way player like Otani does. And and it it doesn't take away from what Otani's done. Now, had Aaron Judge cooled off, had he maybe got to 52 home runs, had he hit 280, you know, had he kind of tapered off a little bit, then I think you have a stronger case for Otani. But most valuable player doesn't always – it doesn't have to mean that your team goes to the playoffs. But what player has not just – which – how to articulate this? Which player has the most value to his team when it comes to winning ball games? How much better are the Angels – because of Shohei Otani. Now, a lot of people would say, okay, that's that's faulty narrative because mm-hmm. he because of the team around him. But I've seen Aaron Judge at the plate affect more games this year than Otani has. Otani will go three for four with two home runs, pitch 10 strikeouts, and, and the freaking Angels will lose nine to four. <laughs> now, if Otani's coming up in the bottom of the ninth and he's hitting walk-off home runs, to me, yes. Otani is valuable, but I don't see him as the difference maker in the games. So if it's just like how much is is he valuable to the team? Well, of course, Otani is the most valuable player to any team. But who's the most valuable player in the league to me says, what has this guy done for his team? Again, the only two wins the Yankees had against the Astros this year were because of Aaron Judge. Not anybody else. And not only that, Aaron Judge has sustained his pace and is at a triple crown pace. He deserves the MVP because of his stat line alone. And I don't think there's any argument. There's going to be some first place votes for Otani. I just, again, had Otani maybe had a few more wins under his belt, had the Angels moved the needle a little bit with their team with Otani wins, four or five more wins. I just don't see how you ignore what Judge is doing because mm. it's not just his bat. You See, you can't negate a fielder in right field that has a cannon for an arm who can catch yeah. pretty much anything and say, well, his fielding doesn't count, but Otani's pitching does. And you can't – and then I want to know defensive runs saved. Who's got more? I don't know off the top of my head. But I'm sure he's got several defensive run saves out there in right field. You know, as much as I hate cheering for any Yankee player at all, I would say that if Aaron Judge doesn't get the MVP, it'd be kind of like, eh, kind of a snub. Um, Because if they give it to Otani, it seems like they're just acquiescing to, well, he's a popular player. Trust me, Otani will be in the MVP talk. He's going to win it next year, probably. That's the thing. And so I say it's Aaron Judge. I, I was going full on Jordan Alvarez, you know, all star mm-hmm. break midseason. I was like, there's no way. And I like, I, I want to see, I want to see a Yankees Astros ALCS. I really do. And look, I'm not afraid to bring the teams into it because 
I know the Astros have the best record in the American League, but the Yankees do have the best run differential. Like, I think that has to matter. And the Angels, I know it's not all Otani's fault. It's none of it's on Otani. But we can't forget that the Angels at one point this season lost almost 20 straight games and they fired their manager. Like, I don't know if you can have an MVP on a team that had their manager fired before he even got to the All-Star break. And um, also, a lot of people try to make this, like, hypothetical argument. Like, if you switch the teams, the Yankees might even be better, actually. Like, I actually don't think that's true i actually think the yankees would be better with aaron judge as opposed to otani because i feel like they need oh i they i feel like the yankees need judges bat more than they would need otani's versatility with pitching and hitting because the yankees their rotation has been very good this year has been very deep bullpen has been elite as well but i look at that lineup like if judge tweaks an angle uh an ankle i've been saying this with sully like i look at the yankees completely differently if judge gets hurt and has to miss a week of games a team like the astros if jordan alvarez gets hurt i still view that astros team as a potential championship World Series team. But if Aaron Judge gets hurt on the Yankees, <laughs> I'm all of a sudden like, yo, the Yankees are out. They have no chance in the playoffs. I don't feel that way if, you know, a guy like Jordan Alvarez or one of these other MVP candidates gets hurt. I think Judge just means so much more to the Yankees because of his at-bat and all the runs and the walk-offs he needs to have this year. Yeah, and there and there are some in, intangible things there. And I think if Aaron Judge was doing what he was doing on any other team, um, and even if they were just simply a contender, like a wild card, I still mm-hmm. think that they would say, okay, they're there because of Aaron Judge. Yeah, and I've also said, like, if you switch Judge and Paul Goldschmidt, then yeah, I would probably give Otani the ad- Whoa, hold on. Mind. I don't know if you heard that. Baseball reference all of a sudden <laughs> yeah. started playing these ads and videos. I don't know why they want to become ESPN. So oh, wow. That. that was annoying. But, uh, uh, yeah, I've been saying the argument, like, okay, let's say Paul Goldschmidt was in the American League and Judge was in the, in the National League. Then, yeah, I might give Otani the MVP award over Paul Goldschmidt. But Judge is literally having one of the most historic seasons we've ever had. So I'm like, you have to reward this. It, it just wouldn't be fair not to give it to Judge. So one other guy I want to ask you about when it comes to award season, because I want to bring it a little bit back to our Astros versus D-back series, because in game two, we got to see a battle of two Cy Young candidates. I don't think Zach Allen's going to win because Sandy Alcantara should be Cy Young hands down in the National League. But I think Zach Allen should finish top three and probably not three. But Justin Verlander, he had another fantastic start as well. And I think he would have been the Cy Young favorite before he got hurt. So where do you think he's going to finish in the Cy Young race? Do you still think it's his award to lose? Because I know he lost a lot of ground, at least in terms of innings pitch. His sample size might not be as great as some of those other players. Yeah, I just I don't see how I honestly don't see how Dylan Cease jumps him. Um, the only other pitcher I think that that deserves a nod over Justin Verlander, and I'm not being a homer when I say this, oh. is Framber Valdez. Framber Valdez with 25 consecutive quality starts. That's crazy. All-time major league record for a single season, both AL, NL, both leagues. But Justin Verlander had a stellar game, eight strikeouts. He only gave up a couple runs. I, I mean – what more does Justin Verlander have to do at 39 being on the bench for two seasons, two seasons. He's out. He comes back at 39. He basically numerically has the best output he's seen on the mound since his MVP and Cy Young year when he was young, when he was young Verlander, this is JV 2.0. This is an Android. This guy is not human. What he's doing I, I just don't see the only person I would have said would have leapfrogged him. I think is Framber Valdez, and if Framber Valdez didn't lose that, um, lose that streak, and if he would have been able to finish his last couple games with a victory, I think he might be able to overtake him. But I don't think the voters are going to be able to look past JB's age. And this next game, if he gives up zero runs, he will match or beat the all-time ERA record for a single season. Full, um, by set by uh, Pedro Martinez. There's some record he has like 1.78 or something ERA in a Cy Young year, I think. And so there are some things there, some elements to Justin Verlander's game. He's given up zero runs 10 times, and as many times as he's done that, and as many times the Astros haven't given him run support, he's won nine of those 10 games. And they haven't given him a ton of run support, but he still has 17 wins. He really should have 19. He might actually should have 20 right now. Um, a, a couple of those games go go differently. This guy's looking at 21, 22 win season. Justin Verlander, hands down, AL, Cy Young. 
Yeah, I'll probably give it a Verlander. Cease is going to be close. I just looked up his ERA. It's like a 209, but he only has like nine more innings pitched than Verlander this year. So they'll probably give the nod to Verlander over him. Valdez is going to be in there. Alec Manoa, too, for the Blue Jays. But I think yes. they probably give it to Verlander. But look at Verlander's baseball reference. The interesting thing, the interest, interesting thing about his baseball reference is basically – if you look at the last full season Verlander has played, because if you take out 2021, he missed the whole year. He was hurt. 2020, technically not full season because of the pandemic. So if you take out that year, this is kind of Verlander's second straight Cy Young Award. Like the last two full seasons, yeah. this year in 2019, he was also the Cy Young Award winner. So basically the last two full years, 30 plus starts we got on Verlander. He's been a Cy Young Award in both of those seasons. And one is post-injury. So it's really crazy to see that he's doing this, especially without – your guy, Brent Strom, not no longer in Houston. So it's really just a credit to, I guess, Verlander himself working himself back and the kind of work that think he has because I don't even know who like who's the pitching coach now for the Astros. We have we have um Murphy and Miller. Um uh, these guys, Brent Strom said the reason why he left is because he knew someone was gonna come cherry pick those guys and he wanted them to stay in Houston. And he thought it was someone else's time. So Miller and Murphy have done a phenomenal job. And, I mean, look what the Astros are doing. They have one of the most elite bullpens. They've got seven starters. I mean, who has seven starters going into the playoffs? You've got guys going, well, we're, we're arguing over three guys for the fourth spot. I mean, that's insane. And then we've got Hunter Brown. I mean, this kid is a phenom. But think about Justin Verlander in this way. Justin Verlander, he – and again, didn't touch a baseball for for, for two full seasons. Mm -hmm. And now he is pitching and he's doing routines and he's going back. Like when you watch him, when I watch him on the field, when I'm at games and he's in between starts, he works out there like a high school pitcher trying to develop and trying to become a better pitcher. He's gone back to the basics. He listens to his body. When he pulled his calf muscle the other day, he said, I'm not going to come back early. I couldn't come back early and be injured and look at my team in the face, and look at the city in the face and go, well, sorry, injured for the playoffs. So he's been the ultimate responsible person with his body, and that's, I think, key to his success. Yeah, and speaking of the playoffs, Brett, the Astros, you know, they could have clinched the number one seed if it wasn't for those pesky D-backs because I told <laughs> your guy, Eric, it was going to be a split because I'm never betting against Zach Gallen in game two. And it was really because of extra innings. It wasn't even because of our starters because that was basically just a, a, a stalemate between Verlander and Zach Gallen, both of them going seven innings, just phenomenal stuff by those two. But when you look at this postseason field, which team scares you the most? Who are you most worried about as an Astros fan? If there's any, because of course you guys, the most confident bunch there is out there. So is there anyone out there in the playoff field that scares you a little bit? Well, yeah. I mean, look, let's be honest. It's the playoffs. So you should respect every one of your opponents. But mm -hmm. there are opponents that I think you match up with better than others. There are opponents that I think offer more of a threat. The big threat I see in the, I hate that we're playing the winner of the Toronto Tampa series just because I don't want to see George Springer hit Springer Dingers in the okay. playoffs at Minute Maid Park. I, I don't want to see Bichette or Guerrero Jr. or any of those guys go off or Teoscar Hernandez, former Astro. Now, um, I think we match up better against the Rays. Now, I have more fear for the Blue Jays, but I don't think that we lose against the Blue Jays. I think the Blue Jays make it a real battle. The other team that I think is the team that every American League team needs to be on notice are the Cleveland Guardians. Mm. They have been sneaky good lately. They have been streaking. And they're the most dangerous team because nobody's expecting them to do a thing. Look what the Braves did to us last year. Even, even, even the Braves locked on host – was like, oh, yeah, Astros in five. Like, nobody, <laughs> nobody picked the Astros to lose that World Series. And that was without McCullers. That was without Verlander. Now we have McCullers. We have Verlander, and they're both healthy. The Cleveland Guardians could spoil the Mariners parade, could go into New York and shock the world. And if they bring that kind of moxie to the ALCS, the Astros can beat them. But, man, I think that's a tall order. So I think the Guardians are kind of my sleeper poisonous pick. Um, but I want to see the Astros and the Yankees in the ALCS. I, I think that's what everybody wants to see. You have to. Because we've had great battles 
in this year, the battle would be amazing, especially with as good as Aaron Judge is going and with as good as our pitching is. Dude, let's do it. Let's just freaking go mano a mano. Just throw that heater up the middle, rise that fastball, and see who can connect and who can score the most at the end. Yeah, and for the Yankees, I think that series would just mean so much more. I mean, the Astros have been in the World Series so much the last few years. I mean, it, it, they've even won it. I mean, for the Yankees franchise, I've been starving for another World Series ring. Only the 09 ring in the last 20 years. Like, it's championship or bust time for the New York Yankees team. Like, Judge might leave if you don't win it. Aaron Boone could be fired. Like, there's going to be big things dropping if the Yankees don't get a title this year. And I like your call of the Cleveland Guardians rotation very nasty with Bieber yes. Tristan McKenzie they've had some really good boppers in their lineup with the Jose Ramirez's rookies like Stephen Kwan have looked really good too but if you guys get the Blue Jays in the next series that could be scary because they got a lot of boppers in their lineup as well like you just mentioned Alec Manoa we talked about earlier he's going to be a Cy Young candidate maybe Barrios picks it up for the playoffs we'll see he hasn't been very good this year but if you get Tampa Bay if Tampa Bay beats the Blue Jays I think you guys are walking into the championship series because Tampa Bay to me I don't know how much you watch basketball but they're like a regular season like a Utah Jazz or something like that like (laughs) they get a lot of wins in the regular season but once you get to the postseason I think they just get too much into the analytics and it's like listen sometimes you just gotta go with the vibes your guy is hot just keep him out there they're like nah it's his second time through the order we gotta pull him right now like i don't think the Rays model it works for the postseason i think it works really good for the regular season but for the playoffs i'm not a big proponent of Rays baseball usually so if you guys get the Rays, i think you guys are walking to the championship series brett i like that take i i, I just think we match up better with them um again I still don't think the Blue Jays in the end beat the Astros, but it's going to be definitely a much more of a nail biter. And they're just a more formidable opponent and going to the Rogers center, possibly to play a couple games. So um, I'm just excited because this, this, this playoff season, I keep telling people is going to be the one of the most exciting playoff seasons that the Astros have ever experienced. And we just hope that it ends the right way. And that's all I'm going to say. I'm not trying to jinx anything. I'm not trying to predict anything, but it sure would be nice to be celebrating in November. And I'm pulling up the wild card race right now because looking at the standings as we're recording this September 29th, 6.34 p.m. In the National League, I believe the Brewers and Phillies are tied for that last wild card spot. So we still got a little bit of drama and intrigue in the National League before we get to the postseason. Brett, for the people who are listening on audio only, where can they find you on social media? They can find me at H Town Wheelhouse on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. They can find the show at Locked On Astros on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok. Um, you know, go to YouTube, subscribe to our channel, download us on anywhere you get podcasts, and check us out. Even if you just want a Houston perspective on things, or even if you don't, even if you want to listen to us and you want to hate on us, hey, we welcome all listeners because we wouldn't have this world without different opinions. And you got someone like Miller Thomas leading the way. And I promise you, if if he likes us coming on, I think you guys would enjoy listening to our show. So check us out. Yeah, and you could go give them crap for giving us three players in a Zach Greinke trade that really haven't made an impact. Oh, Stone Garrett. Stone Garrett. I forgot to mention Stone Garrett's a local kid from Sugarland. He's oh, now really? finally made it up through mm-hmm. the minors. This kid's a beast. I saw him hit a tank at Constellation Field when he was in AAA. But I wish Stone Garrett all the best. It's really cool to see local kids from local high schools making it in the major league. So good luck to Stone going forward. Well, we might need to trade him because he's like our fifth outfielder. We're just loaded in the outfield. So you guys might – I love Stone Garrett, but you guys might need to take him off our hands because we just got too many guys. <laughs> Brett, H-Town Wheelhouse, thank you for hopping on today, sir, and I'll catch you next time. 